Well, in July, Nigeria's President Muhammad Buhari told the world that the country's budgetary allocation to education will increase by 50% by 2023. Actions have, however, hardly followed. Currently standing at around 6% of the total budget, Nigeria's education is in need of more funds and, more importantly, the desire for growth and literacy for the highest number of out-of-school children in the world and a continuously deteriorating education system, Nigeria needs to do more to protect its future. Promises have been made, declarations have been endless, but real progress has been, until now, next to nothing. Nigeria's education system is our focus on VSA Today. Welcome, M. Suleiman. Well, at the Global Education Summit in London in July of this year, President Buhari of Nigeria promised to improve Nigeria's education and increase the country's budgetary allocation by 50% by 2023. Education has hardly been top of the interest of recent Nigerian governments, and this is evident in the budgetary allocation to education and the number of industrial actions in the country. University lecturers impact upon a nine-month strike between March and December of 2020, and their demands are hardly fulfilled till now. The quality of education in Nigerian institutions are declining, and the quality of teaching is facing a hit. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed Nigeria's struggles with digital education, with some lecturers and students unable to handle new teaching methods in line with global development. Unit of schools are dilapidated, state-owned schools are unguarded, unfunded, left to rot. The quality of products of secondary and tertiary education in Nigeria is on a free fall and the children are hardly in class. In recent years, there's been a surge in the establishment of private universities in Nigeria. These universities, more than offering a solid platform for school leavers, desirous of tertiary education, they have become channels of obtaining questionable honorary doctorate degrees and hardly recognizable first degrees. The functions of the NUC as a regulatory body have come under intense scrutiny with the accreditation of courses and universities now becoming a jamboree. For well, joining me to unpack this on the square is Dr. Tunji Oguyemi. Good to see you, Dr. Oguyemi. And uh, this is one issue you have always spoken about, just like some of your colleagues. Time was when Nigeria's education system consistently produced some of the finest professionals in the world. So what's the role of the government in the decline of tertiary education? Uh, Dr. Nguyemi, I think you need to unmute uh, your mic. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. I think the problem started when government began on the trajectory of deliberately reducing the proportion of education funding of the total expenditure of government. Do not forget that in Nigeria's immediate uh, post-independence government, particularly the government of Alaji Tafawa expenditure on education alone was 27.6%. 27.6% throughout the period of nine years, between 1957 and 1965. But the decline started really uh, during military regimes. No military regime in Nigeria invested up to 10% of the total expenditure of the country in education, regardless of the fact that we actually earn more money uh, from oil export. I mean, the problem continued until President Shil Shagari did something significant about education by starting uh, a system of Federal University of Technologies. One University of Technology in Oweri, another one University of Technology in Akure, another University of Technology in Mina. And after that, all successive military regimes in Nigeria 
and of uh, that of President Ibrahim Babangi, that military president, invested less than three and a half percent of the total expenditure of government between 1986 and 1993 uh, in education. What that actually portends is that consistently since 1972, two years after the war, investment by the federal government, the state government, and if you like, local government in education declined precipitously, such that the interest and the welfare of teachers declined and the capacity of the private sector to fill in the gap became even um, ridiculed. So there's nothing you can, you, you do not, if you have not put anything in education, or if you have put too little into education, you can therefore not expect that you will live bountifully from that area. But it is not only in investment in education, it's also in the discouragement of the culture of intellectualism and the culture of knowledge. See, education is an industry. And in the knowledge industry, you, there is a chain and it cannot develop in a silo. It develops in accordance first with the fiscal policy of the government, second with the educational policy enunciated to guide development, and third with the training and deployment of high network individuals. I mean, highly motivated teachers to teach in our schools, particularly in the primary and secondary schools. So the fortunes of education since 1966 has been that or a decline, first, in the quality of teaching, second, in the quality of studentship, third, in even enrollment, particularly in the northern part of Nigeria, and in the issue that has to do with investment in education. What we have today is the result of consistently um, divesting from education and the knowledge industry in Nigeria. Well, it's really a sad one listening to you talking about, you know, uh, how it all began, looking at the free fall, which has ultimately affected the teaching uh, profession as well as the students. And uh, you've also, well, sort of, uh, you know, indicted all, all arms of government, uh, the federal, state, as well as the local government. But quickly here, I, I know, uh, well, you're also uh, in the academic, uh, you're an academician, uh, uh, a teacher, uh, you're most likely not oblivious of uh, the number of private primary and secondary schools in Nigeria. And they all came about, uh, you know, with uh, the intention to fill uh, the gap which you have highlighted uh, in the schools, uh, you know, uh, established by the government. Have they uh, also been able uh, to do that which they were, you know, set out to do? Um, I, I, first of all, I will not minimize the importance of private investment in education. No, nobody should be, nobody should be hard uh, to do that. Uh, they have actually done well. Uh, in fact, the, the first <laughs> secondary education in Nigeria actually started uh, through the efforts of the private sector, uh, the CMS Gaba School, um, which was founded by the private uh, initiative of the Christian Missionary Society. So uh, the same thing is Opu Wadel School in the eastern part of Nigeria. And the, no one can minimize the impact and the significance of the private investment in education, particularly of missionary schools. Missionary schools by the Baptist, missionary schools by the Methodist, missionary schools by the Anglican churches, the Christ Missionary Societies, uh, and the Catholic Church, uh, which has performed very well in this area. But, since the decline in the 1980s, particularly in the middle of the 1980s, the introduction of the principle of structural adjustment program, specifically in 1986, uh, government uh, investment has no died, has gone south. And the purpose of investment in education by the private sector has changed from an intention to create a crop of highly educated, highly motivated, morally sound, and spiritually set people to the intention to make profit. That is, they have been driven more, private sector seems to have been driven more since the middle of the 1980s by the desire for profit rather than by the desire uh, to make education be um, at the center of development and growth in Nigeria. And that is the problem. 
Today, you now have a situation in which the private sector have overtaken or the private investment in education, except in Lagos. Uh, in the southern part of Nigeria, private investment has overtaken that of government. You now have more private secondary schools, more private um, primary schools than government schools. And even government schools, you find that even teachers who teach in government secondary schools do not actually put their children in those schools in which they teach. A clear evidence of a vote of no confidence being passed in one. So you see even teachers in public schools put their children in private secondary schools. Reason, they do believe that the private, the private secondary schools are not bedeviled by the problems of um, breaking in, in the academic calendar and so, on, and so on and so forth. But this has inadvertently affected quality. It has affected quality so terribly that the value of education in terms of moral instruction, as well as in the capacity of the students to serve as agents of change, have been ridiculed, have been, have been devalued, really. Um, you cannot say for sure that private education, at least at the primary and secondary school level in Nigeria, um, is, is, such, is such of a quality. You know, if, if you let me, you know, come in here, apologies uh, for butting in quickly here. Uh, you just uh, raise a very important point because I recall, you know, in my school days, having some of my teachers, you know, having their children in the same school uh, with some of us. And I'm quite sure uh, you also experienced that. So that's uh, a point, uh, you know, of, you know, conversation which the government should also be having with the teachers. Do you think that uh, the government is oblivious of the fact that things have gone this really, really bad uh, in the structures of our, of our schools? Of course, government, is, government knows this. I mean, it is an open secret. Uh, you don't expect much from a teacher that is badly motivated. I mean, do you? You do not expect much from a teacher whose salary has not been paid in the last three or four months. I mean, what do you really expect from a teacher who cannot, who, whose take home, cannot really take him home in terms of paying for the minimum irreducible basic welfare of that teacher? His feeding, his clothing, his housing, his accommodation, and basic transport. I mean, what that actually means in essence is that the desire to go into teaching by our best hands and our best brains has diminished. Our best hands do not go into teaching. Have you noticed that? Our best hands go into the oil industry if it is available, or go into government, into civil service. In those days, it was the best of the best that went into teaching, particularly before 1970. I mean, you will not come close to a teacher's training college if you were not good in mathematics, in English, in ciphering, as they called it in those days, and in geography and history. You dare not, because only those who could bear the card dared to enter those schools. At any rate, there was no quota system then. People were not employed or people were not enrolled in schools just because of the political uh, jurisdiction of where they come from. I mean, today, you, could have, you, have different, you have different shares in those who are actually enrolled as teachers or those who are enrolled as students, rather. You have a station in which if a student, for example, stored about 60% in the exam, and it's from and it's so unlucky as to come from Cross River or in those states, it will not be admitted to Unity School. But if the same, um, you know, the same age student in a different part of the country scored 13%, it will be enrolled in the same school that had been denied someone who scored 60%. So you have a situation in which there is a conflict of interest in our system. Uh, political intervention, um, if you like, prevent that politics, um, and then issues that has to do uh, with the poor remuneration of teachers, all have combined to ridicule our educational system and not our best hands uh, patronize that area any longer. Well, uh, Dr. Nguyemi, just give me a minute. Let's uh, welcome uh, uh, Dr. Tokpe Gloria Olatunde Ayedun, who's uh, uh, also joining us uh, to have this conversation. Uh, uh, Dr. Ayedun, good to see you and thanks for your time. Uh, we've been having, uh, well, uh, Dr. Ogiemi started off by letting us in about how the free fall, talking about the rot in Nigeria's education system, started uh, taking us uh, back memory lane, especially after the Civil War. 
Tell us uh, some of the key things that you've also observed, because uh, what's making the round at the moment, uh, as a certain university in Nigeria has just graduated some set of politicians, uh, uh, which Nigerians have been asking how come, uh, for instance, a law degree during the, the, a pandemic will see people graduate within the space of a year or two. Uh, bringing Nigeria into focus. Do you think Nigerian schools today can boldly vouch for their products, uh, Dr. Ayedun? Well, uh, it doesn't yes, say... thank you so much for having me. This is a very important question by Stanley. And Right now, we cannot really vouch for our product because of the facilities that are available. The facilities available are quite um, below standard compared to the other developing countries. And so that's why right now it's not really visible to say boldly that our products are better off than those. However, we have products that can actually do the work. They have the skills, they have the knowledge, and they can actually enroll in any task that they have been assigned to. Okay, I'll come back to you, uh, Dr. Ayodun. Once again, thanks for your time. Uh, Dr. Ogui, I mean, quickly here, uh, specifically a university in Nigeria's capital, Abuja, uh, Bayes University has been in the news, uh, had some graduates, some of whom are known politicians in Nigeria. The degrees awarded were gotten before the number of years it takes to obtain such degrees. Uh, isn't it high time the, the Minister of Education looked into the operations of uh, the NUC? Well, if the facts, if the facts are, are absolutely correct, the Council for Legal Education uh, will apprehend that. I trust I trust them for doing that. You can't get a degree in any Nigerian university for a period less than four years. If you did, uh, then you would not be enrolled for the law school. Uh, what you just get will just be that you read law, not that you're a lawyer. You're not. You're not a lawyer, really, if you are not called to the bar. Uh, that settles it. But really, it is the diminution, the reduction, the disgrace of the National University Commission's role by the governmental institutions themselves. I mean, which organi organization, which institution of government is chartered by law to register university to also guarantee uh, the courses they are, they are offering to the public and also accredit their courses? It is the National University Commission established by law and had been in operation in Nigeria since the early 1970s. But what do you have? You have governmental institutions circumventing the National University Commission. I dare say disgracing the National University Commission by going ahead to establish without, without more, without consideration, we are deference to the National University Commission, uh, several universities. You have the head of Hami the other time going to establish university and turning the university into a rural amenity. Really, they're putting the university in their rural villages. You have the even in the national even the national assembly has a quasi, if you like, pseudo university institution. It is called the National Institute for Legislative Studies. It awards degrees. It awards degrees, master's degrees in legislative drafting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have the army, the police establishing a university. You have senators creating universities from the chambers of the senate and the house of and the, and the, and the house of representatives. So where where lies the National University in all of this. Is the National University, consult National University Commission consulted? The answer is no. And that tells us that in Nigeria, we either ridicule our institutions or we refuse to allow them to work and do their work. Today, universities have become rural amenities. They are no longer institutions that you know, are established purely on the basis of needs. When I remember in 1958, when the then University of Peter was to be created, a minority, a minority report was um, was upheld by the government because it followed a, a commissioned report as to the need of the Western region. Even the University of Ibadan followed as a result of um, another commission of inquiry that was set up to establish whether Nigeria actually needed the manpower, the high network individuals 
as at that time in the 1940s. So there has to be a justification. Is there what manpower gap are these private universities trying to fill? Do we have the manpower gap? The answer is no. And the federal government has joined the fray too, establishing universities and producing graduates that are not required by the market. I thought to establish a university would be that the government will consult the Nigerian Employers' Consultative Assembly, will consult the Manufacturer Association of Nigeria, will consult the National University Commission, will consult the Academic Staff Union of Universities, and then try to see whether there is a gap in our production of high net worth individuals that has not been met, and if it has not been met, to get a specialized university to recruit students and meet that demand. Unfortunately, politicians have turned universities to instruments of compensating themselves in every central district. So the universities are no more uh, urban institutions. They are now rural amenities for developing rural areas. Let me bring in uh, uh, Dr. Ayudun here quickly here. And uh, we're trying to look at the uh, out-of-school children in Nigeria. And uh, it's, it's really a sad one to see that Nigeria has the highest number uh, of out-of-school children in the world, not on the continent, but the world. And it has lasted for a while, and it doesn't look to decrease in any, at any moment from now. Are there way forward? Uh, you know, that the government should be looking into helping reverse the trend uh, for Nigeria. Thank you. The out of school children is a major concern in the country, especially in Nigeria. It has been an issue that has been on, and this is why in the Sustainable Development Goals 4, that say their quality education should be given to all. The children have the right to education. And all our children from the from the primary to the secondary especially need to have free and quality education. And this is something that has been in the policy all along. But it's the implementation now that has been an, a major issue. So I feel the government needs to do more in terms of implementing all the policies that have been stated in the National Policy on Education 2004. And it should be revised again to fit into the present condition, the present standard of education that we are in. Because actually, if you are looking at the National Policy on Education 2004, and what is presently going on after the post COVID, uh, after the COVID-19 era, you need to see that so many things have changed in the education sector. Therefore, the government needs to revisit the policy, also needs to revisit the curriculum. What are these children being taught? Why are they out of school? These are the issues that need to be curtailed. Once the government can do this, then the, 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 the children can as well be encouraged. Because so, even if you give them the, the quality education, even if you give, there are some children that are discouraged now. Well, there seem to be. The... As, or, as small as 10 years old, if you have seen that. Well, there seems to be a glitch uh, in the connection to you, uh, uh, Dr. Ayedo. I hope, I hope uh, it, uh, the, it will improve. Uh, but before that, let me quickly go to uh, Dr. Ogunyemi. And, well, apologies, uh, Dr. Ayedo. Uh, we have to reconnect with you so that we can have a, a seamless connection. Uh, let me come to you, uh, Dr. Ogunyemi. Some of the key things you highlighted, um, uh, talk where Gloria Ayedung just also mentioned, talking about how out of school children. Specifically, you also mentioned in your opening, you mentioned northern Nigeria. It is instructive that we we'll start talking about some of these, uh, you know, uh, issues, uh, the pain children go through, uh, to the extent that even in other parts of Nigeria, we've seen children that should be in school uh, being transported. Uh, does it even bother you? Who takes them away from uh, that, you know, distance to other parts of the country uh, to beg for arms? Uh, these children are never in school. I suspect you are referring to the Almajiri system. The Almajiri system is uh, one of the Achilles' heels of northern Nigeria. 
uh, with due respect to that part of the country. I mean, great people, great nation, great community of people are there. And I can tell you that some of Nigeria's best brains and best talents are in, are in another part of Nigeria. Great people, no doubt. But you see, it's high time we thought of stopping a system that necessarily makes a people um, slave to their customs. I mean, culture is a thing that is not static. It's, it constantly evolves. The truth of the matter is that the Amadjuri system has done an incalculable damage to the opportunities of Northern Nigeria and their children to get full education. But even at the present, it is not the most immediate problem. The most immediate problem in another part of Nigeria is the, is the issue of safe school. Even when you have people, the few that you have in schools, are they safe in those schools? I mean, the hoodlums, the terrorists that are kidnapping children in Northwest, Northeast, North Central, all parts of Northern Nigeria, have they stopped? Have government apprehended them? And if government has not apprehended them, how dare anyone say that the children are not in school? See, you try to solve the problem of a nation as it comes. And you also try to solve the problems based upon planning. But more important is planning. There's actually no plan to transmit the imaginary system into the modern system of education. If you have Quranic education, that's good. I mean, that's, there's nothing evil in Quranic education. It's even good for the moral upbringing of the, the average person, even in northern Nigeria. But it needs to be modernized. It, you need to do that in conjunction with modern Western education. And forget the issue of some people say Western education is haram. I mean, it's actually nonsense. A Western education is actually very good. And it is good not just for the development of, of the person, the personal of that person, but also for the nation. I mean, you need Western education to develop modern science and technology to go into space. These are done by West education. So in that instance, I would think that government first of all guaranteed safe schools in another part of Nigeria, including Plateau State, which is the North Central. One of the leading states in the northern part of Nigeria with a high enrollment rate. But today, that enrollment has no that high, has gone south, and it is not good enough. I think government need to do up the ante in the area of safe schools in the north. And then we may begin to interrogate the issue of the majority and the uh, poor in schools. Well, before yeah. we go on a break, uh, break uh, let's quickly take this, and it has to do with um, UBEC and uh, the universal primary education. Uh, recall Nigeria has a shortage of teachers, because you said something which is quite instructive. Many Nigerians will recall truly and honestly about uh, having the very best as their teachers. Uh, I recall one of my teachers who could take uh, us in physics, chemistry, and biology, and he was fantastic. And we saw a genius in him. And today, uh, well, the very best, as you highlighted, aren't close to our schools anymore. So the shortage of teachers in the region of 280,000, that's the last figure we were able to get. I, I, I do hope that uh, that is still the, the case. But with the number of unemployed graduates in the country, what can the government do to encourage more people to take up teaching profession uh, voluntary teaching profession, I should qualify that, so that it doesn't look like because you're, you're out of work, that is uh, the second alternative for you to go into. Uh, I see you smiling because you understand what exactly uh, is at play here. Help us here, uh, Dr. Nguyemi. I, I, I share in your nostalgia about the yesteryears. That was beautiful. Don't forget, even as early, even as, early as the, the middle of the 1980s, Ghanaians, Indians, Pakistanis, Egyptians flocked to Nigerian secondary schools as science teachers. Filipinos taught me physics, chemistry, biology. Filipinos, people traveling from the Philippines to teach. I was taught government by Indians. I was taught English language by Indians. I was taught, yeah, I mean, by people who came from outside of Nigeria. Then, Nigerian educational system was so competitive. So com the graduates of Nigerians were at, was among that top, I mean, among the best in the world. But you no longer, it, the star system permit to happen like that because there was a welfare program that could attract those foreigners into Nigeria. We could bring in the best. But today it is no longer so. That's number one. Don't forget, investment in education is about 80% in terms of teachers. 
80% of them must go into the quality of teachers, the number, the, the, and the readiness of these teachers to teach in the rural areas. It is when you establish this that you can begin to interrogate the issue of classrooms and of the environment. But even then, you can do it simultaneously. See, the issue has to be that our best are no longer coming into education. If anybody had a first class, do you think you, you will want to remain in the university system? You think he, he, some of our, teach, our students will look at us and tell us that they don't want to look like us. When we were talking about the 1970s, late 70s, and early uh, 1980s, we looked up to our teachers. We wanted to be like them. We were calling them Fikemba, physics, chemistry, biology. They mean our mathematics teachers. We loved them. We wanted to be teachers. I mean, I got my inspiration as a teacher from my own teacher. I mean, and, and that's what I want to do. So do, do you see how such motivational teachers any longer? The best of our best are either in the banking industry or in communication, like, like you. Imagine if Suleiman Alele teaches English language with baritone boys in the secondary school. It will be a uh, great inspiration. But you see, we've lost you to the industry. So no thanks to the poor remuneration in the system. We need to fix that. We also need to fix the issue that has to do uh, with um, poor quality of enrollment. See, there's no need making a student to endure learning. No child will ever be in school if that child is not at least five years of age. But you see parents today, a child that is just two years, he being rushed to school. So he will go through enduring teaching, enduring learning, and not enjoying it. The National, uh, National Education Research and Development Council has established that the psychomotor of the child is not properly developed to receive teaching until around age five. Unfortunately, because the child, because the father and the mother had to seek for daily bread, they will just go push the child to the school so that the teacher can become the second or the first parent. It's a big problem. But well, finally, I, then we, uh, okay. The, the, let, let's take a moment. We'll come back so that we can start talk, uh, talking about some of the key solutions to some of these things. Uh, the good thing here, uh, Dr. Ogami, is that every Nigerian and African watching can actually, you know, relate uh, you know, to some of the things, if not all of them, that you highlighted. But when we come back, we'll see how much of a solution we can get uh, to the problem. Join us again. home stretch here on VSA by the dictates of some cultures uh, females don't go to school in Nigeria sadly that's uh, almost the case and the difficulty of turning this around can't be overemphasized girls don't go to school like their male counterparts in Nigeria uh, with this reality tied around strong but uh, old and unproductive cultures as highlighted by Dr. Guillaume some of these cultures uh, must give in Nigeria, the education of the girl child in rural areas stands at 35.4% of the total population, with the overall female illiteracy rate sitting at 48%. Now, the best societies are those who have managed to train and educate their girls. Uh, they are builders and leaders. More children will become educated when girls become educated. Nigeria's education system is battling a host of factors including corruption with TED Fund and UBEC being labelled in different corruption scandals. These are just bodies set up to improve Nigeria's education system and despite the paucity of funds, they are available is hardly used judiciously. Nigeria University leadership is, are also sometimes fingered in power tussles and scandals that affect the quality of delivery 
at the end. The issues are enormous and the solutions are not far-fetched. I still have with me Dr. Tunji Oguyamiye and Dr. Tokbek Gloria uh, Olatunde Ayedun with me. And uh, thank you very much for your patience and time. Uh, let's, let's start with you, uh, uh, Tokbek Gloria. I hope the, uh, the network will not, uh, well, you know, uh, be a sorry one this time. Quickly here, I want us to start talking about girl child. When, well, we, we have mothers, we have sisters, and some of us have daughters, and we have female friends. And uh, one of uh, such great Nigerian and African is you uh, before us today, uh, Dr. Ayedu. Uh, I know when you hear people who still think that uh, the girl child shouldn't have an education or uh, even when a family is really down, they think that the man or the individual in the family that should step down for another is usually the girl child. How can Nigeria reverse this trend, whether cultural, ed, religious, other things you, you, you know that the government and the people can do to reverse the trend? Yes, we can actually reverse the trend by starting, by changing our attitude. We need to start changing our attitude the way we think about the girl child. Train a girl and train the nation. Once you train a girl child, you automatically train a whole. Because the girl child is the one that will become the mother. They are the future mothers. They are the ones that will take care of the home. They take care of the nation. And they are even taking care of the whole country now. And so the girl child needs to be more encouraged. And I think now, Basically, in Nigeria, I think we are, we are doing well in a way because some of the girls and some of the schools that I've gone to have been able to see that there are girls, there are girls more than the men, men now, or they are equal in numbers. Yeah, so good. now we are trying to emphasize more, more homes, especially in the north. That they should please release their girls, they should release their daughters, let them uh, engage in uh, education because that is the power that a girl child has. Once you are educated, you are more exposed to so many things and you can also take care of so many uh, national developments. And that is why we always encourage girls to come out and do uh, daily school and go to school. Well, it is, it's a good thing that uh, you've been able to uh, speak with some of these people. And it's a, another good thing you've just told us that the trend is already uh, well being reversed, having more girls. Uh, but uh, quickly here, you know, uh, let's ask you this. Uh, I, it's not every day I have an environmentalist here with me on the show. You know, Nigeria has a, a quite a, a high rural illiteracy rate. Uh, that's a fact. But as an environmental education expert, how can the country improve the delivery of education in those rural communities, some of which you have visited? Yes, one of the major goals of environmental education is to create awareness, creating awareness on global issues, such as environmental problems, especially the crisis that we have uh, um, on climate change. There's a, there's a red alert going on on climate change now. So we, as environmental educators, we have to create necessary awareness on environmental problems and try to see ways that we can actually mitigate uh, measures to improve, to improve our environment and to reduce so the, this environmental crisis. Also, in terms of adaptation, there are some crises that they are already there. We already have it now. How do we adapt to the crisis? Just like the COVID-19 now that we have, and we are in the post-COVID-19, how are we adapting to it? If, can we really change the situation on ground? How do we create this awareness? So our major goal as environmental educators is to create awareness, then get the right knowledge, because you must have the knowledge before you can disseminate to others. 
if you don't have the negative uh, knowledge, then there's no way you can discriminate it to others. Also, the right attitude to learning. There must be a right attitude to learning. How are they learning? Do they want to learn? Are they eager to learn? Do they want to know? Are they eager to know? That, that is when you will know that uh, they want to learn. So the right attitude, the right capacity building, you must get the right use involved. As an educator, as a teacher, you must be a good listener as well as a speaker. You must be a good communicator. You must be able to relate with your students. You must be able to tell people and they will be able to understand what they are saying. You must be able to speak their language in the language they understand. In, in, in the language they understand, in the sense that you should come to their level. You don't need to be speaking too much of it, and we are trying to give them so much um, drama. Well, I, I think, it, well, I, I understand, I, I, I understand the fact quickly here. Uh, uh, well, again, apologies, uh, well, the, the, the glitch again in that audio connection to you, uh, Dr. Ayodu. But again, we understand what you say, come to the level. That brings us to, uh, let me stretch this. Let me bring in uh, uh, Dr. Ogunyemi here quickly. I, I, listening to uh, Dr. Ayodu, some of the key things, I, I smile because I see that uh, we're all guilty here. Uh, the media inclusive. Uh, Dr. Ogunyemi, once upon a time, uh, radio and television stations have belts for children. So it was, an, it was everybody's business to train the child and see that he or she learns something fantastic. Uh, there were belts specifically created by television stations and radio stations. We woke up someday and they all have disappeared. So how can we start changing things, uh, making people understand the importance of these future or leaders uh, that we have sort of neglected? Uh, the problem was caused by the reversal of values. Reversal of values. Now, those, the things that the whole community, you know, it takes a village to teach a child. You know, you know the, the, it, that time was a time when value uh, was placed a lot uh, in education, in intellectualism, in service, um, especially in hard work uh, before this world, uh, as well as value was placed upon process, not just results. Process, that is the procedure to getting uh, anything from the society, uh, you had to uh, follow those procedures. Today, you can have someone who has never done any work in his life uh, suddenly become a senator, become a House of Representatives member, a House of Assembly member, and in, in two years, it, 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 it runs into millions. And here you have a teacher who has been teaching the last 25, 30 years, not even able to buy a bicycle. So it's, the, the reversal of role was instigated by materialism. Uh, the period of the 1960s, 70s was not a, it was not as if people didn't want to have houses, cars, beautiful clothes, but that that was not the guiding principle of their values. The guiding principle of their value was what in the Southwest we call omoluabi, that is the virtuous man and in the North is a religiously or um, a spiritually properly brought up person. And in the Southeast, a honorable man. These were the values driving the society then. And please, for your information, sir, let me say this, that in the whole of the South, the gay child education is not a problem at all. Absolutely not. In fact, in the Southeastern part of Nigeria, it is the reverse. You have the male child actually dropping out of school to go and learn trade to go and learn how to do business than the female. So you have, in the Southeast, the female dominating their schools. Where you have problems of the girl child education is essentially in the North. Let me give you an instance, an example of, the, of, of, of just Castina State. See, enrollment in Castina State is 15%, but enrollment in schools in Osho State is 92%. 92, you had the percent. So only very few, you, that, except those who really don't want to go into schools, that will not get education in the southwestern part of Nigeria, where it is taken as a religion. So the truth of the matter is that it is the, it is the rural areas that actually do suffer. Why? Because of three things. One, poor infrastructure. Two, the issues that has to do with teachers not wanting to go to the rural areas to teach. The solution to that 
get a little bonus, a higher bonus for any teacher who volunteers to go to rural area to teach, and then do the educational input by building standard schools and the teaching aids. Actually, in the rural areas, why children uh, do not want to go that their enrollment is less than 50 percent in some parts of the country is actually because of um, non access to teaching aids and teaching materials like books and textbooks. But in terms of enrollment, the enrollment is good, especially in the rural areas of uh, the southwestern part of Nigeria. And even in the south south, you will find enrollment in excess of 60 percent. That's salutary, even in England. I mean, it's not everybody that goes to school. So the truth of the matter is that if you can do three things, infrastructure development, special encouragement to teachers in terms of their welfare to go to rural areas, and then teaching aids, all of these are capital expenditure that should be done by government. So except we actually do something about that, we aren't going to roll back uh, either the value system or the poor enrollment in rural areas in different parts of the country, especially in northern Nigeria. I'll come back to you. Let me quickly uh, bring in uh, the, the Chocolate Gloria again before we, we wrap up this conversation. And it, it has to do with, uh, you know, trying... Uh, I understand that well. Okay, good. Uh, I, I was thinking that uh, we're still uh, we're not able to connect to you. You know, let's talk about, you know, some of the key things we raised. And it has to do with teachers. Uh, how can we have more people in academics like yourself, uh, like Do Dr. Ogunyemi? How can we encourage people? Uh, you speak with students and you have your students. Uh, have you been able to uh, sort of encourage more people to look up to you, to, you know, filling up the gap as highlighted by Dr. Ogunyemi? Yeah, one of them major things of making and teaching attractive is by collaborating with other teachers. Collaborate with other higher teachers, other senior colleagues. I always used to tell my students that teaching is beyond just the four walls of the school. It's beyond just the classroom session. It goes beyond just what they are saying. Teaching has to do all, all it is a daily basis, it's a daily business. It's what we embark on, either intentionally or otherwise. So how I actually attract my students is by telling them what it means to be a, a leader, to be the one to impact knowledge, impacting what you have, knowing your team, impacting the knowledge, having passion. For, for for change because as a teacher you are the change that you want, that you are looking for you you can actually change your the attitude of your students so it is a privilege to be a teacher because you can actually change their way of life you can impact knowledge to them and so all those things actually attract my students more to me also, likewise, I, 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 I want to just regret a little bit that once you want to be a good teacher, try to collaborate with other teachers. See what they are doing in other developed countries. Why are people moving to other countries? Why are they looking, seeking for greener pastures? Can you incorporate that to your own um, country, in your own country? Try to uh, collaborate with uh, institutions which is what we are doing in the University of Africa. We try to collaborate with institutions from China, from the US, UK, to see what they are doing and to see if we can actually invite the same thing in our institution. With this way, the standard will be higher than what we have now. And um, also, we can also try to help um, our students by bringing more computer literacy. Now, the world is changing into an online teaching, into remote teaching and learning. Let's try to also as teachers and, and, and concentrate our mind towards teaching uh, using technology, using our computer system, using the phone. There are so many apps now that we can use, that we can send to other students of our choice, and they will also be able to learn. Using social media, even this means so we can use it. Let's try to change the world. 
change, change with the world, change with how the world is seeing education. Without the, the standard will be higher than what we have now. Thank you. Let me uh, close with uh, Dr. Ogunyemi. Help us here quickly. And uh, well, uh, but again, I also uh, let you weigh in quickly if you if you have anything to add to what uh, uh, Dr. Glura has said. But quickly, I, I want you to close on telling us which is uh, increasing the budgetary allocation to education or having a complete a complete overhaul of the education system. What you will advise the uh, government of Nigeria at this time? Doing the two simultaneously, doing the two simultaneously. If you invest in education and you do not tinker with the curriculum, you do not look at the area of needs, you do not look at infrastructure of teaching, which includes classroom, desks, chairs, tables, teaching instructions, I mean, I mean teaching aids, you do not look at the issue of teachers, simultaneously, uh, the investment will be a waste. Uh, education is actually, uh, it's not a tea party. It's not a key party. Only very serious nations um, go into investing in it. Look, the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization has given the, 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 has given the minimum irreducible uh, ratio of investment. It says not less than 26% of the income, I'm sorry, of the expenditure of the state should be committed to education. Not less than 26%. That's about a quarter. So in the situation in which education has been accounting for less than 10%, in the last 30 years. What do you expect? So we want or we pray that we have a system in which simultaneously with the private sector, government invests in infrastructure, invest in human capital, as well as invest, uh, as well as increase the quantum or the proportion of its expenditure that actually goes into education. Well, I think it's a fine place for us to leave it today, but uh, it's an issue we'll stay on as more Nigerians troop out of the country in search of greener pastures or better education schools on the home front suffer from lack of development. Like every human capital sector in the country, education is suffering and the results are for all to see. Half-baked graduates, corrupt administrators, and many more. The problems are known and solutions are the next step as highlighted uh, by my guest today. Many thanks for being such nice company, talk back, Gloria. Olatunde Ayedu and uh, Tunji Ogunyemi uh, is always a delight. I'm hoping that we'll have you again uh, subsequently uh, not in not too distant time for us to look at education because it is the way to the future and the future to any part of the world is now. The Nigerian government must do better. And Sulaiman, see you again. <laughs>